to Franchi Talks Japanese Art. I am Franchi and today I would like to talk to you about a type of Korean tea balls that was used in the Japanese tea ceremony. So in this video we're going to talk about the type of tea ceremony in which these tea balls were used which is called Wabicha or tea of wretchedness. Then we're going to talk about how these tea balls actually came to Japan and how they were used in tea ceremony, what kind of meanings they carried within themselves or what kind of role they played. And then finally we're going to look at one of these tea balls and we're going to explore both its physical appearance and its history. So if this sounds interesting to you, make sure to stick around and let's jump right in. So the type of tea ceremony that we are going to talk about today is called Wabi Cha which we can translate in English as the tea of wretchedness. This kind of tea ceremony, the development of it, started in the 15th century and there is a tea master which we can call like the forefather of this type of tea ceremony who was Murata Juko, who was active in the 15th century and he was a tea master, he was uh, active in the Buddhist, Zen Buddhist field. He was the first one to develop a very specific set of rules to follow when preparing the tea and he made it into a kind of formal ritual. He also introduced a number of new ideas to the tea ceremony. For example, he was the first to consider the idea of performing the tea ceremony in a solitary and natural setting uh, which then became the tea hut, which uh, the, ha the idea of performing the tea ceremony in a secluded hut is uh, in a garden, it's still used today. And he was the first one who wouldn't just use Chinese objects, but he used, when preparing the tea, Japanese objects as well. And it is important to know that he preferred very simple rustic objects. So his preference for a solitary and natural setting and very simple and rustic objects, all of his attitude towards preparing tea can be actually summarized in one of his sentences, which is very famous, which is a moon without clouds, it's disappointing. What he means with this beautiful sentence is that when we look at the moon, it is better to appreciate it when it's slightly covered, when it's a little bit hard to see, it stimulates us more, we are more intrigued. And he prefers that towards a beautiful moon in a clear sky. And so that's the same with the objects used in a tea ceremony and the tea ceremony itself. It's more beautiful when it's slightly imperfect. So continuing on the development of the Wabicha, we can say that the ideas which were developed in the 15th century by Murata Juko carried on in the 16th century, where we find another great tea master who was called Takenojo, and he carried on the idea of rustic simplicity of Murata Juko, and actually he was the first one to attach the idea of wabi to the tea ceremony. I think many of you have heard the word wabi before, it's very common to find in Japanese design, for example with wabi-sabi, but actually the concept of wabi is very old, it was developed in the 12th and 13th century uh, in the field of literature by some hermit poets. These Japanese poets, they refused living in society, they decided to live a life of poverty and solitude and in fact they use the word wabi which means to be wretched, to be poor. And in the 16th century Takenojo borrowed this word from the literary field and applied it to the tea ceremony. Materially, uh, the way in which wabi manifested itself in the tea ceremony was by was translated into simple objects. So objects which spoke of everyday life, of poverty, 
and they wouldn't show up, wouldn't show off great wealth and riches. So these ideas of simple rusticity and preference for imperfection, they were continuously developed and in the end of the 16th century we actually find one of the, if not the most famous tea masters of Japanese history and his name is Seno Ryukyu. He's he was very famous because he was working alongside the most important members of the military elite at the time. For example, he served alongside Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the two of the unificators of Japan. Of Japan. So the tea ceremony of Senorikyu was actually found in a context of politics and power. And it wasn't uncommon for the military elite to organize tea ceremonies and tea parties at the end of military campaigns. The way in which Senorikyu developed the tea ceremony was by implementing the idea of wabi in every of its aspects, as well as embedding the tea ceremony with the Zen thought. So at the time he was serving alongside the military elite and the religion of the Japanese warriors was that of Zen Buddhism. Uh, partially because it developed the ideas or it heightened the ideas of uh, simplicity and discipline. So at the time when Senorikyu was working with tea and working with the border elite, one of the sayings of the time was that Cha Zen Ichimi, which means that tea and Zen have the same flavor. With his uh, work, Senorikyu brought the Japanese tea ceremony to its apex and we can say that, we, that it was a ritual embedded with artistic culture, ethics and philosophy. The way in which the Zen thought and the idea of Wabi were materially shown during the tea ceremony was with the accused preference for the objects that he preferred. And also in this case, he preferred very simple, once again, rustic objects. Senorikyu specifically loved earth-toned ceramic and earthenware and he even collaborated with the Japanese craftsmen on a certain type of ceramic called Raku. However, we are not going to talk about <laughs> Raku today, we are going to talk about Korai Chowan. So now that we have a kind of context about this tea ceremony with a preference for rusticity and simplicity and imperfection, we can look at the Korean tea balls. So now let's look at these Korean tea balls. These tea balls were of course made in Korea in the era of Choson and they were made around the 15th and 16th century. The main reason why we're talking about them today is because Senori Q, he actually said that they were characterized by the element of wabi. So these tea balls were made in Korea. They were everyday objects. They were meant to be containers for rice and drinks, like alcohol or vegetables. And that's how they were made and what were they were thought of. But somehow some of them arrived in Japan. One of the theories is that the first ones were actually object of contraband because in fact there were no legal trades between Choson and Japan. So somehow they must have been pirated from one country to the other. But once they arrived in Japan, these tables were really sold after the after before also and after the Senor Q gave his comment about them, many tea masters highly appreciated them and wanted to have some and so they became because there weren't so many, they were very highly prized. And 
After that, the merchants who were living and working on the Japanese island of Tsushima, they actually realized there was a market for them. And so they worked towards legalizing trades from, from Choson to Japan and actually managed to do that in the 1640s. Now, the, the temples, they were really valued. Some of them were so famous and so important that they were given their own individual name. This was a practice which was quite common at the time in the context of the tea ceremony, that an object would be so valued that it would, have, it would be given its own name, like my name is Franchi, and its history would be recorded and the objects would be passed down from generation to generation. This was the fate of many of the Korean tibos and many of them are still in Japan, they are still known by their name and today we're gonna look at one called Shibata. Shibata is a beautiful Korean tibol which was made in the 16th century in, you can see, Korea and it perfectly fits the aesthetic of Habicha. If we have a look at it, and it should be appearing somewhere around here, uh, we can see that it's made of earthenware. It's very simple, and the color is slightly yellowish. This was uh, made through a glaze. Actually, this glaze in this color is called in Japanese Biwairo. Biwa is the name of, uh, in Japanese, of a fruit in English known as the loquat. So this kind of color makes us think of this fruit. But at the same time, we can see that towards the upper rim, it has some kind of blue tinge, which uh, makes us categorize it as an Aoi Iro, Iro Chawan. Aoi means Japanese blue. The imperfection in this tea bowl can be seen in many different elements. For example, we can see that it's not entirely smooth, but there are a lot of cracks in the glaze. This was not a mistake, this was a wanted effect. And at the same time, we can see that when making the bowl, the potter, he left some marks with its spatula, and also some marks were left by the wheel. Shibata was made, as we mentioned before, in Korea, and then it moved to Japan. We don't know much of its history in Korea or of its moving to Japan, we don't know how it arrived there. But what we know is that once in Japan, it was owned by one of the most important warriors of Japanese history, which is Oda Nobunaga. Oda Nobunaga is today considered the first of the three unificators of Japan. And he actually started implementing a series of politics which were connected to tea. For example, he had a strategy of collecting tea objects. He had a huge collection and the way in which he acquired them and the way in which he gifted them to other warriors was actually part of some kind of political games which showed power, wealth and the relationship between warriors. And the reason why I'm talking about gift giving and the politics of tea is because Shibata is an example of this. Shibata was owned by Oda Nobunaga, but actually was gifted by him to Shibata Katsuye, who was also a Japanese warrior lord. He, was, he served alongside of Oda Nobunaga after 1556. And when the Tiba was gifted from no Oda Nobunaga to Shibata Katsuye, it took his name, Shibata. The reason why I think the history of Shibata is so interesting and also imp historically important it's because it shows us how this object, it was conceived as a simple bowl made for everyday use. But once it arrived in Japan, it became a symbol of understated beauty, of rustic imperfection, which at the same time was valued because of its imperfection. But then, when, once in the hands of Noda, Oda Nobunaga, it became a symbol of political power and relation between powerful warriors. 
so it can make us think about the various meanings that objects carry within themselves. So I hope you enjoyed this little travel across the tea ceremony and how we talked about Korean tea balls and I hope you let me know what you think in a comment in the comment section and I hope to see you again soon. Bye!